We're not in assigned seats yet. That comes later. Feel free to sit where you like for the first uh, part of class today. The plan that I have for today is to use about half of the time to talk about Christopher Alexander and talk about the assignment and then the rest of the time for you all to meet in groups just to start doing uh, that group assignment. And uh, before we begin, and then we'll take a break sort of halfway through for you to get into your groups. Um, so before we begin, does anybody have uh, opening remarks, objections to what we've encountered so far, heartburn, <laughs> heart palpitations? It's okay if you don't. Uh, show of hands, who was able to find time to read the strange reading for today? Many of us, thank you for doing that. Um, that reading is something that I, uh, it really had a profound effect on me. And as a librarian, I am embarrassed to admit how I came by this. Um, it's a very short story, I won't uh, belabor it. I had the opportunity to go to Japan to speak at a conference. And prior to that, that was three years ago now, prior to that, I had taught a little bit of Chris Alexander here and there, uh, but not very much because I didn't understand it all that well. And I also, in retrospect, believe that I had a resistance to the core of the ideas because of my uh, inf having been influenced strongly by Richard Saul Werman, somebody who teaches that there is no right way to do something, but there are good ways. That felt like it had a lot of room in it for all of us. And the preachiness of Chris Alexander's work, especially reading the big yellow books, uh, there's stuff in there that I enjoyed in the way that I enjoy poetry, but it was hard for me to find ways to rationalize its use in a course like this. Um, and that's saying something, because uh, as you've seen, I've been able to rationalize all kinds of crazy shit uh, to bring into this class. Uh, but this is different because it gets at cosmology. And that is the thing that I wanted to understand. And it wasn't until uh, two things. The experience of going to Japan and visiting the largest thing that Chris Alexander built, which is a high school. It was uh, built as a combination high school and college, but it is being used exclusively as a high school today. Uh, 40 hectares of a uh, giant built environment that caused me to feel things in my body uh, that I was not prepared for. Uh, we visited this place as a curiosity Peter and I, and uh, we left as changed people. And one of the stories the vice principal of the school told us is that uh, this school has an effect on students, students who have learning disabilities, uh, disordered cognition or disordered emotions, that this place changes people and that the students who go to this place, it's a exclusive private high school, it was built in the 1980s and it doesn't have all the modern technologies. It looks like it's 400 years old. Many students come to this school resenting the fact that their parents sent them here, she said. And by the time that they graduate, they come back after graduation. They keep coming back to here and they say, I, I wanted to feel what this feels like again. It doesn't feel like this out there. So uh, having had that experience myself, I was interested in this uh, as part of my research obsession with Richard Saul Werman. I was flying through Boston uh, with some regularity and I wanted to see if there was a recording of Chris Alexander talking about this stuff at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. There was a famous debate between Christopher Alexander and a uh, deconstructivist architect called uh, Peter Eisenman that uh, they purportedly had recordings of and I wanted to hear what this guy sounded like because in a transcript of this debate, he sounded like he was uh, an angry asshole. 
And so I went to this archive and uh, I asked the librarians if I could listen to these recordings that I saw from their online catalog they possessed. And I was told that typically when researchers come to a research institution, they make uh, prior arrangements and that this was a little unusual and they had another class in the archive at the time. Um, but she accommodated me and she gave me these uh, discs to listen to and uh, a internet connected, this is the part that I am embarrassed to admit, uh, and an internet connected computer. And because I didn't have enough time to listen to all of those discs, I made copies of these discs and I put them on uh, my private G drive and then I left the archive. And then uh, a couple hours later, I listened to what I had uh, caught. And uh, what I had caught was not only the recordings of this debate, uh, but something I didn't know existed, which was the recording of a speech that Chris Alexander gave the night before the debate, which the debate references, but I'd never seen uh, this uh, speech as a transcript before. I didn't know that the recording existed. So that is the reading for today. I think the website that I linked to got it from my bootleg. Um, and uh, archivists, I don't know how you feel about this, but uh, the leakiness of this knowledge, uh, I was grateful for it. I'm not sure I would have been able to pull this off in the way that it was supposed to have happened. And the result was uh, connecting with this work on a really uh, in a way that I couldn't before I read this and listened to this. So this is kind of a special little uh, piece of his work for me that allowed me to appreciate uh, a lot of things about that work. And the simplest way of saying it, which I felt first and then uh, tried to read from the books, but the way that he talks about it in this speech, the idea that space is not a neutral medium, that there is something happening uh, at a fundamental level, as far down as you want to go, into quarks and strings and uh, subatomic particles, if you like. Um, that space is made of something and that it wants some things more than other things to happen. And that, uh, this sounds awfully arrogant, that there are ways to know how to put space together to make it be alive. And uh, part and parcel to that is the belief that most of the making of things that people have done for the last couple of hundred years is wrong. And it's worse than that. It has created deadness in the environments where people are. And that that is why we are as disordered as that's part of the contributing factors to why humanity is in the sorry shape that it's in, if you think it's in sorry shape, that we are uh, cocooning ourselves with dead things that are at odds with the way that the universe and matter and all that kind of woo-woo stuff wants to work. And so uh, having a simple way of thinking about that uh, was really helpful to me. And I've continued to visit uh, his work. It means a lot to me just this past a uh, week, I went to Lake Travis. I trespassed and took some pictures of, uh, this is one of three houses that he built um, in the 1990s. Uh, I visited the last thing that he built, which is this amazing visitor center for the gardens at a college called West Dean in West Sussex in England. And uh, I've also visited and got a very similar story at a shelter for the mentally ill homeless population in uh, San Jose, California. I talked with the executive director of this organization. She had no idea who made the building. She knew that it was a weird building because they had some repair problems she brought people in to take a look at and they refused to, eat. they walked out saying, I don't know what this is, I don't understand this. Uh, so she didn't understand that. And one of the reasons that that happened, why the people who operate this homeless shelter uh, didn't know anything about their building's maker is the original charity that built it was bankrupted by the process of working with Chris Alexander to realize something like this. Because this uh, way of building requires every layer of the process to be done in a way that is uh, kind of, uh, not kind of, that is orthogonal to the way that commercial construction process wants to work, to the flow of money in the way that money works, 
And so uh, what Chris wanted to do with this building was have the way that this building works help to bring order to disordered people. And he sat under the train bridge with some of the people who would end up living here in the process of figuring out what that means. But it's uh, one of his books is called The Timeless Way of Building. And a timeless way of building, if any of you have been involved in software projects uh, with budgets, uh, which is most of them, you'll also, you also quickly realize a timeless way of building is a budgetless way of building or a budget busting way of building. Uh, there are no drawings of end states of these buildings. The way that these things are made is collaboratively with people uh, letting the built thing emerge from uh, practices that uh, uh, the faculty at the University of California at Berkeley and the architecture school who taught in the same department as Chris Alexander sued the university for years to get him uh, out of there because what he talks about uh, doesn't work. Uh, except if you do what he does, which is to integrate designing, building, architecting, all of it into one continuous process. And it, he asks and then answers the question, are all things equally alive and real? And uh, there's a philosopher named Wendell Berry, who uh, is co-emergent with Chris Alexander's ideas. He wrote something called Solving for Pattern. Um, I'm not, I don't know that they knew of each other, but uh, I find this to be helpful in talking about what is the, um, how do we answer this question of, are all things equally alive and real? Barry says, there's a kind of egalitarianism which holds that any two things equal in price are equal in value, and that nothing is better than anything else that may be profitably or fashionably replaced by it. Forest equals field equals parking lot if the price of alteration is right. Then there is no point in quibbling over differences. One place is as good as another, one use is as good as another, one life is as good as another if the price is right. Thus political sentimentality metamorphoses into commercial indifference or aggression. This is the industrial doctrine of the interchangeability of parts, and we apply it to places, to creatures, and to our fellow humans as if it were the law of the world, using all the while a sort of middling language imitated from the sciences that cannot speak of heaven or earth, but only of concepts. This is a rhetoric of nowhere which forbids a passionate interest in, let alone a love for, anything in particular. The egalitarianism that says all may believe what they want about anything is something that we rely on the academy to provide for us. And part of the reason why uh, this work is uh, not understood well or widely taught is it does not permit this kind of egalitarianism that says value is a matter of it depends. This is predicated on a cosmology that says this barn, which is near where I live, and this house, which is going up in a place where a barn like that used to be, that that is not a question of what I like or what you like. That that is an absolute question of value and that we could say that this has more value than this, even while the commercial forces are what's causing things that look like this where I live to get turned into stuff like this. This whole way of thinking would say, we know why this is happening. It's because of a Cartesian sense of value being a matter of it depends, not a fundamental sense of value being inherent in things. So as you, some of you read this speech, Alexander uh, in the early 80s is talking about having come up with an empirical way of testing value in anything and it's a fun experiment to run. It's called the mirror of self. Uh, so you all have digital things. Um, if you would like to open your computers if they're closed or get your phones out, things that connect to the internet, there is a bit.ly link there. And we can run this as an experiment right now. And the way this experiment works is which of these two objects is if you have to pick one of them, that's the little conceit. You have to humor uh, the person who wants you to take this test. Uh, it asks you to just go along with this. If you have to pick one of them as a picture of your true self, 
Um, all of you, not uh, which one of these do I like better, but which one, if you had to take it as the representation of everything about you. Uh, another way that he's run this is to say, if this was the form that you would take in the culmination of your whole life, if you have to pick one, and it's funny, uh, but of your true self, pick one. Uh, he says that the agreement on this is cross-cultural and exceedingly strong. And the way that he came up with this is by doing this same test himself for over 20 years, every day, looking at objects, using his feelings to ask which one of these feels like there's more me in it, my truest self, if I have to pick one of these. And then thinking about what are the characteristics, why is it so? Um, and, and use this to come up with, with this very uh, challenging theory of an absolute basis for good and bad that we all know. So has everybody who wants to vote had the ability to, does it even work? There should be a, uh, this is one of those usability tools, one of those free usability tools. This one, that one, which one do you like better? So let's see. Um, I'm going to hide the process of getting there so that uh, we can build uh, suspense. Also, I always forget where it is. Ah, uh, yes. Anybody want to share their reasons for why you picked one or the other? Uh, ketchup bottle folks, anybody? Go ahead. So I kind of like went back and forth a little bit because I figured the, with the salt, it's made up of a lot of little pieces and like they're individual. And I feel like I'm made up of a lot of little pieces. And then, but the difference between the two for me, um, I wanted to go in with ketchup because with the salt, when you shake it out, it kind of spreads over a lot. And so I feel like that's more of like an extroverted thing. like get to know people in a crowd, kind of like share a lot. Whereas I'm more of like a one-on-one -on -one ketchup kind of person. Like <laughs> one, one cheeseburger at a time. And like I'm better to get to know really well in like a one-on-one -on -one setting. I like it. Yeah. I like it. Anyone uh, who chose the salt shaker? Chose it. I don't think I know why, but uh, I was just looking at the form factor. And the salt shaker seems more modest. That was my rationale. OK. Any other, uh, yeah, which, which one did you pick? I picked salt, and I, I think it is made more interesting to me by Jordan's dramatically different understanding of salt versus ketchup. Um, <laughs> I think, like, because he's, he's got a point about, like, ketchup being a little bit more dynamic, and I felt myself mm -hmm. leaning away from that dynamicism and, like, preferring to be the near ubiquitous but ubiquitously <laughs> complementary thing rather than the potentially polarizing singularity. Nice. Yes. I think salt just because I'm a really salty human. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Oscar Wilde said the suspense is killing me. I hope it lasts. Uh, <laughs> we have to get stuff done in here, so I will release the, uh, the suspense here. 51% uh, went for salt shaker. I've run this with audiences of all sizes uh, in multiple continents now, and uh, this is the weak, some of the weakest agreement I've seen, uh, but it's always the salt shaker. And uh, I've done this, I had a really great opportunity to do this. I had a student in this course who uh, did not see, she was blind since birth, and we did this with objects. I split half of the class. There's a room right around the way behind here through that little alcove. And half of the class was blindfolded and given two objects to feel or smell or touch. And the rest of the class looked at two sets of objects and did the comparison that way. And it worked on the basis of touch uh, about as well as uh, on the basis of sight. And always there was agreement uh, sometimes uh, statistically eh, agreement like we got in here today. 
Uh, but the theory is, and the reason that, uh, you can rationalize this in a lot of ways, but I think the experiment is predicated on the idea that we could do this with any choice that we have as makers, as participants in a process. If we were to do the thing that many of us, uh, either on the basis of humility or on the basis of egalitarianism, um, maybe cutting against the forces of user-centered design uh, to say that because I am made, my eternal self is made of the same thing that uh, what I'm working on is made of, I have everything that I need to figure out what would be more preferable, what would be good and bad to do. I can just ask myself this question, and if we can work in small enough increments uh, that we could build things that have wholeness and beauty in life, because... Uh, value is not neutral. Space is not neutral. Uh, we have a value detection system in our self. And if we focus on self in the things that we do, if I could see more of me in my work, uh, it will be more whole and beautiful and alive. He says in the nature of order. So after that bootleg of that uh, speech, that set me up to read the four volume magnum opus, the, the nature of order. And it made a whole lot more sense to me. This is from that book, from book one. The methods, the methods I propose make use of the fact that each one of us as an observer is directly tuned to the phenomenon of wholeness and is able to see both wholeness itself and the degree to which it is present in any given situation. It accomplishes this awareness of wholeness by asking people for a judgment which comes directly from their own feeling. I do not mean by this that we ask someone, which one do you feel is best? I mean that we ask specifically which one of the two things generates in the observer the most wholesome feeling. Google Pixel phone, iPhone. This is saying that we could use our feelings to say and know um, which one is more good for us. The two arguably things that are not good for us. One of them is less bad for us is what this says. I had a really potent experience of this with a, a friend of mine, coworker Joe Elmendorf, an alum of this pro of this program. Uh, we were doing some consultant work, consulting work in Encinitas, California, and went to a coffee shop. And I was served coffee on the tray on the left, and I was marveling at what a great little coffee tray it was. Then Joe's order came up, and he was served coffee on the tray on the right. And we started to look at these things, and in my endlessly pedantic way, I was saying, Joe, dude, this is it, right? This is everything that Chris is saying is happening right here. Um, these two trays, uh, how do you account for, how could we explain the difference between them? The visual difference on the bottom picture there, you can see that the side, I have another picture of this here. The side sort of scoops down and then it goes up. And our theory was that that was to make room for the swing of the coffee handle. And that's why it had that nice uh, smooth uh, curve to it. But then when we did the experiment, we had both of the trays sit next to each other. The squarish one, the one with the little darker uh, stain on it uh, that he got, the handle cleared it just fine. Uh, and what is the reason for that? I think uh, this explanation from the transcript, it's the difference between the order of space, the thing that he's talking about, that you can get to through this naive self process, uh, and the order of the Coke machine, which is what generates the thing, uh, the argument would go on the other side. Uh, if you ask what kind of order can be understood by these means that have been available to science, the kind of order that one can understand thoroughly is, if I put it very, very crudely and stupidly perhaps, is the order of a Coke machine. When you have a Coke machine, you put in a, qu a quarter, click, 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 various things get tripped and so forth. Finally, out comes the Coke bottle. Now the order of that machine, the way in which one thing leads to another, this causes that. The overall structure of that machine permits it to do, to do and behave the way that it does. That is, all of that kind of order is thoroughly available to us given the mental attitude that we've inherited these 300 years. Uh, they are built the same way. The joinery of the joints is the same. 
but the reason why the one on the bottom there is uh, has more of that life to it, our conjecture was they had a certain number of these beautiful little trays made and then they got successful and then they needed a whole bunch more trays. And the order of the Coke machine is you take the thing that works. Uh, the reason why it works so good is because it was wiggly, because they were responding to this. This is our story. This is how we told it to ourselves. This beautiful opportunity, this awesome coffee shop. They made this really weird tray. And then, hey, let's, let's, let's blow this up. Let's support our demand. And what do you need to do in order to do that, especially living in the world of uh, value is it depends, is you saw off the wiggly bits and uh, make it fit with everything else. So the productionizing of this tray into the world of uh, stack them up and get rid of the wiggly bits. Chris Alexander would say that's the difference between something that's alive and dead. The life was in it and then in order to reify the cosmology of the order of the Coke machine, this is why we can't have nice things. And functionally, they are the same. You can turn the, the handle clearance thing. That was not what was going on there. I saw this uh, beautifully in the bathroom at that shelter for the homeless mentally ill. A uh, dingy bathroom here. And I was, my heart skipped a beat when I uh, felt this cascade of shapes that was happening there. There's a urinal tucked in between those two uh, vertical walls. And the picture isn't very easy to see this perhaps through the projection, but the wall that's closest out is a little bit lower than the wall that forms then the shower behind it. And with the window, it creates this beautiful cascade. In that transcript, Chris talks about having identified geometric properties that correspond with when you make things this way, when you let it be this reflection of wholeness and beauty and life in yourself, uh, this is the sort of decision that you could make, which is against, uh, if they were working off of drawings and plans, this never would have been made that way. It's actually harder to draw something with two different heights than it is to, especially with a computer, to copy paste that same uh, rectangle in the CAD program. But just that little difference of creating that uh, uh, difference in levels of scale uh, it protects your privacy as somebody standing up going to the bathroom there in the men's bathroom there. Uh, your privacy is equally served, right? A little bit more of your shoulder is exposed. Uh, you could never make a choice like this is the argument uh, using system B, using the, uh, uh, the thing that we do that uh, Chris's work is trying to get us to not do. Uh, and one of the reasons why we can't do it is because these decisions are prior to function. And I love the way that he starts out with the caveat of, you don't understand, I am a minute workaday functionalist almost every day. But the explanation for this goes beyond, this is not beyond, this is prior to thinking in terms of how do you solve the problem of privacy in the bathroom at the homeless shelter. Uh, every act of building um, done with the idea that there is a correct way to do this uh, if we could just listen to ourselves and uh, feel it out. A single solid objective basis for good and bad. And the reason, again, why this is so woo-woo, why a lot of people are uncomfortable about this is the claim is, is that those same forces uh, that allow you to make the right choices to make things that are good are the same thing that's going on like with metal shavings in the presence of a magnet. That this is what the whole universe wants to do. Uh, cosmologically, if you are not bought into this, it's pretty hard to rationalize um, the kinds of decisions that are made in these places that have these, I have found from firsthand uh, experience in them, really powerful effects. Uh, so what we're gonna do with the second group project is going to use one of the tools in the Alexandrian toolbox. And admittedly, it's the one that if you only use it by itself, it's the one that fails every time. Uh, in this picture of the different layers at which uh, things happen in, uh, for humans in our environment, 
from Stuart Brand's book, The Clock of the Long Now. Uh, my sense, uh, Alexander didn't situate it here, but my sense is the patterns that you're going to be working with from this book, uh, Pattern Language, which is the best-selling architecture book of all time, best-selling book on Oxford University Press imprint of all time. Um, the, the reason why this failed, the, uh, there's a biographer, Stephen Grabau, who wrote a book in 83. He's, he characterizes Chris's own uh, critique of this which is that all the architects and planners in Christendom, together with the timeless way of building uh, the companion book to this one and a pattern language, could still not make buildings that are alive because it is other processes that play a more fundamental role, other changes that are more fundamental. Patterns are a really good way to get in that meaty middle. That's why I'm delighted to force you to grapple with them because I think they help and they tell the truth about something that is invariant in the environment on that seam between governance and infrastructure, um, or maybe uh, who knows where it is, but it's, it's in a funny place. And it certainly doesn't address the whole thing. And that's, I think, why the pattern language by itself. He talks about people who use this book and its companion to make buildings. And even his own building, he made a, a clinic in Modesto, California. When it was handed off to a contractor to build, what came out the other side was uh, dead. It wasn't the thing that he wanted and that's what led him to become a combination uh, contractor architect, something that uh, people uh, like in the American Institute of Architects, you are not encouraged to blend these two disciplines and uh, to really build in the way that he does, you need to address all of these layers all the way down to the cosmology, culture, nature level. But we're going to have fun with this one. Uh, and sort of to close off my sort of lightning description of this uh, transcript, uh, this is one of my favorite things that he says. So that's what I'm really getting at is the existence of a level of thought or a level of reality where order and space is such a deep phenomenon that it is capable of generating all our activities as architects and builders. And that function, ornament, and what have you will all come into play as byproducts of that level of observation and thought. If you do end up working this whole stack of the pace layers, that's the kind of, it's such a deep phenomenon he's talking about. I think the reason people haven't succeeded by just trying to use this is that we don't all have the same cosmology. Do we, can we all agree on what is the nature of the universe? Uh, if, unless you can do that, I don't know that you can build this way. But you'll get a, a taste for playing with the pattern language layer at least. So that's, that's the first part. I'm interested in objections or questions that you may have to this philosophy. Is it dangerous to say that there is a solid objective basis for good and bad? Is that anti-intellectual? Were his colleagues justified in wanting that to not be happening on their floor of the architecture building or what have you? Is that why they tried to block? Could you expand on why they tried to push him out? It was, it was a philosophical uh, mal misalignment and their belief that his teachings were harming the students because it was setting them up with a way of working that is utterly incompatible with how things actually get made in the world. Yeah, yeah, he was subverting the commercial viability of the students at a leading school of architecture in the state system. And why do we even have a state system if we're all doing this and he's over here going honk, 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 like, uh, no, we're doing this. Yes. Were they saying that his school of thought was wrong or that it was just infeasible, unfeasible? Uh, I'm not sure. I haven't looked at the, it makes me curious to look at the, the proceedings and to see what the arguments were. My sense is it would have been a convoluted both of those. Even if it is right, uh, you can't go and work like that. And it's quite convicting to me as a practitioner uh, I have not had the ability to work in this way 
And so uh, I have visited the I've been to a lot of the buildings now. I intend to see more of them and I have a amateur's interest in this, but uh, I don't know anybody who is able to work this way in our field or in the built environment. Yes. Wouldn't you need to have access to a deranged billionaire who just really wants that final outcome? You would need access to a deranged billionaire. One of the ways, so Chris uh, was able to fight for and find the right kinds of clients. Um, this visitor center at West Dean, one of the reasons why this was able to be built uh, and the way that it was built with the time and the exquisite care and the exquisite amount of expense is that the Prince of Wales was involved. So that's as close to the, the billionaire patron. That, there you go. That's, that's the kind of power that it takes uh, or the power of rich individuals, right? There's, there's smatterings of these things here and there that you could go see that he's made. Or maybe like time, like evolution, like the beautiful barn probably happened over lots of iterations. Maybe. <clears throat> yes. I'm curious, like just from like an evaluation standpoint, have these buildings lasted longer than other buildings or like how are they, how are they better? I guess, as you mentioned the one, she said she's having a hell of a time getting it fixed. Yeah. So like it is decaying, but so what makes it better? That's a great question. Uh, in the case of West Dean, the rest of the college, these th this garden wall and building, they fit in with the four or five hundred year old buildings that are already on the rest of the campus. And he had to find the local craftsmen who know how to, the walls are made of something called kippered flint which is all of these irregular pieces of flint stone. They chip them into all about the same size. And then you've got a pile of the chips as well. And so the chips get ground into the mortar and then the rocks themselves are like the bricks. And there's some very intricate lead work around this window. So in that case, it's not experimental methods. It was traditional, that's why the Prince of Wales was uh, interested, is because it reenacted this cultural tradition where you could make decisions as it's emerging on how, how high the windows ought to be from the ground. Um, all of the emerging uh, that's required of this process is afforded by these ancient techniques. So the trick at West Dean was finding people who had the memory of how to do this which had been lost. But when it comes to uh, the Julian Street Inn, his experimental methods, in order to build at least close to their budget, it's all, he innovated a, a method of spraying concrete into, uh, first he works at one-to-one -one scale, so no drawings that you're working off of. It's working at one-to-one -one scale with cardboard and scraps, trying to mock up and get the feeling in your body of how this thing is gonna work in space. And then the use of spraying concrete into forms, letting it kind of solidify, and then deciding on like window placement and door placement. And when you don't like it, you can just knock it down. Um, and so the problems that this building had to do with uh, pipes that were encased in cement and blockages in the pipes. It was a French uh, approach to drains, I guess, which sounds terrifying to me. Um, <laughs> So in this case, it was experimental methods. And that's, I think, another reason why I don't know of many examples of other people working the way that he does or getting the results that he does is the brave aspect of inventing uh, a methodology that allows you to make ad hoc decisions from the heart every second of the every day that you're building and to do that collectively with a bunch of people, not just your lone mastermind. And then when you don't like it, the latitude to tear it down. And that's why he was so excited about our opportunity in computing, uh, the ability to work on uh, building things that are whole and beautiful alive depends on uh, generating them. He, he talks about a seed and you need to grow this. Uh, you can't just, uh, uh, just doesn't leap out of your head fully formed and computing 
seems to lend itself more to his methods. But his construction control, the, the arguments for this is it costs less ultimately if you let him build this way and he's got some proof in some of the books. I don't understand accounting enough to know. Uh, I, know I know you can torture numbers. If you torture them long enough, they'll say anything that you want them to say. Um, so I don't know about the claims. All I know is it bankrupted a, a charity uh, in, in, in uh, Northern California and uh, the campus in Japan uh, from us, it was heartbreaking. We walked all over this 40 hectare campus and then one of the last things that we saw was up on a hill, a new building that was built had no relation to the other buildings. It was a new student center and the vice principal said, uh, it is far too expensive to build this way. And especially the maintenance when you're building with wood and uh, other natural materials. So they made a choice to just throw a new building into place using conventional construction on the basis of it costs too much to keep up a wooden building. Yes. Um, I just have a question. I don't even know if it's really a question. It's just more of a, uh, I feel like there's more mission. Like, why hasn't the word art Yeah, and he certainly does. He, uh, yeah, he's perfectly comfortable saying that this process is the same process that makes uh, art. And I think it goes back to that uh, being prior to function. And uh, if I have a checklist of things that the building needs to solve, the people at Lake Travis, there is a new building uh, out of frame from this one. And it looks like what you would expect a lake house to look like. And uh, there's a checklist of, I want a nice view. It's got a nice view. I want a outdoor shower. It's got, you know, it's got all the things. And yeah, this is, uh, this is art. And maybe that's another reason why people don't want to buy this and apply it in a commercial scale is why am I paying artists to express themselves? Yes. Yeah, I think that's one thing that I'm having a lot of problem with is because in the back of my head, I keep on thinking that like his colleagues were like trying to get him like to stop saying what he was saying. But all of this stuff seems like like as a designer, like this seems normal. I mean, maybe like <laughs> maybe not so much with like like there is objective truth like there's a discussion with that but in terms of just the process this does not seem like egregious like this doesn't seem like anything out of the normal what like you'll learn at like design school or like stamps or anything like that um and the second thing he actually reminds me a lot of like frank lloyd wright and what he did frank lloyd wright had to have total domination over his or his architecture so it had to be the furniture it had to be the carpet it had to be everything yep um so yeah, again, I, I just don't, I guess I don't really see the colleagues problems. Good, yeah. It's, uh, I think it's very contextual, the degree and the nature of your dislike of his work. Mm -hmm. There are lots of reasons too. Mm -hmm. um, they happen at different levels. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this story reminds me a lot of the story of uh, Tucker. I forget his first name was a cooker man in Virginia. I believe it's a movie based on him. Yep. Who was it's a great movie. guy who, I think it was like in the 50s or 60s, wanted to, felt that cars were just really fell behind in what their potential. So he decided to make his own car brand. And essentially, um, all the big car manufacturers really didn't want to compete with him because it would have been too expensive to rule air and things like seatbelts and breakable windshields and, you know, soft uh, dashboard so you wouldn't bash your head in. So they literally sued him to the point where he couldn't produce the cars. Yeah, where I used to live in Ypsilanti was a couple blocks from where his uh, workshop used to be. Oh yeah, he almost went to jail for yeah. life because of like fraud. Like, that's, that. that's akin to what has uh, Alexander's experience. There's a book called Battle for the Life and Beauty of the Earth that tells the story of the building of the school in Tokyo. And like any good uh, heroes and villains story, uh, system A is what Alexander thinks of as the timeless way, the thing that he's tapped into. 
doesn't claim to be the author of it, just has rediscovered it or found ways to do it in his own work. And then system B, which is uh, the kind of thing where the cement contractors meet with the principal of the school for dinner and offer a suitcase full of money, like literally the suitcase full of money to say, why are you building with this foreigner? Uh, he's proposing all of these crazy things. Here's the kickback and let's do this the way that we would do this. And uh, uh, being roughed up by the would be bribe people for choosing to work this way. So uh, there are consequences to, at least in the built environment, but I do like uh, from an art standpoint or from a computing standpoint, if this is like, this sounds like agile, this sounds like uh, uh, listening to yourself and working collaboratively in an artistic way, yeah. And uh, that criterion of, um, and this is what I'm most excited about is how dumb this is. And I have had uh, results that I'm very pleased with by using that same thing we did with the ketchup bottle and the salt shaker. Not which one do I like better? And I, and I love it when I find the difference. When I find that I, what I like, it, this happens with me with music a lot. My favorite song, I know it's not their best song. And that's somehow in that same space of what am I liking and how is that different than I'm asking what is this true expression of self because I've got some and the artist has some. And some of it ended up in this song so how do I feel about this? Um, my advice generally to everyone, uh, and very few people are asking for this advice, uh, but is to boost the presence of your body in everything that you're doing. And to me, this, this mirror of self does that because I'm in my embodied self when I'm asking that. And I, you see me doing it, right? I have to touch myself. Uh, where, where is me in here? I, I know I'm in here somewhere. I could do this differently in a way where there would be more me and then, and then I would have more fun because, uh, because it would be more connected to me. Uh, one point of order around this though, is if you are experiencing like many of us do a period of disordered self, the sad part of this teaching is that, uh, you would be cut out from being able to participate in uh, your fullest way. The good news about this is the contention that making wholeness, so that's the whole point of all of this, is wholeness, beauty, life, he uses those interchangeably in the, in the mature work, that making wholeness heals the maker. And so there's this tension between, uh, if I'm really screwed up inside, how can I use my feelings to navigate these choices? Um, that's sad, but the good news is, A, none of this is meant to be done alone in your little room. Uh, this is an ordinary way that people are supposed to do together. So uh, when you are screwed up, hopefully one of your counterparts might be a little less screwed up. And then together, if you're asking the same question, uh, if you start to make changes to the thing you're working on on this basis, participating in that is purportedly uh, going to activate healing in you. So uh, there's that. Okay, other thoughts, objections? We're all gonna spend a couple of weeks uh, throwing some stuff at a funny place that he made in San Francisco. It's a funny bench. Okay, well let me move on to that then.